We thank you very much for watching this program. Keep on watching this program because you are filling your faith with the word of grace. We believers, we need the grace of God. So when you fill your faith with the word of grace, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, through his holiness and power, your faith will take you to the throne of grace where you obtain mercy and find grace to help to fill his provisions on earth. Thank you, and God bless you. As we say here in Well of Life Christian Center, Jesus is Lord, and with all that are getting, get understanding. For the word of life changes life, and love never fades. In Jesus' name, amen. How you can make the Word of God flesh to you. Welcome to This Word is Your Life with Pastor Alexander Arthur. Today, Pastor Arthur brings the message, The Godly Father. So we're going to talk about the Godly Father. Now, I have seven things to cover. And if you say amen often, I will finish in time. <laughs> if you don't, this may be a series. <laughs> and <I'll see> you. <laughs> no, I want to get the seven out. I don't know what I will find. Some of you back here, as fathers, I want to unload all of it on you. But just in case, we don't cover all of them. Let me tell you the seven things that we'll be talking about. A father, a godly father, is someone, first of all, who loves God. Two, loves his wife. Three, loves his children. Four, is a provider. Five, is merciful and kind. Six, is a prayer warrior. And seventh, he is a father of faith. So as we go down the list, fathers, check yourself where you need to improve in. Just make a note of it. But we will certainly give you enough to work on as we go on. The first one is a father who loves God. You cannot actually be a father worth your salt if you don't love God first. The scripture says, that you cannot be a leader unless you are first a follower. You cannot be the head of your home unless you are a follower of the one who is the head of all heads, if you will. So to be a godly father, you start by loving God. How do you demonstrate how do you show, how do you prove that you love God? The Bible says the person who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that person proves God to be true. And in that regard, that person is really, therefore, a born again child of God. And for that, proves that God, that he loves God. So if you don't actually show that you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have not received him into your heart, you can never, as far as God is concerned, you can never be a good father. You can never be a godly father. How can you 
follow, how can you lead if you cannot follow? And who are you going to follow if not God? And so it is important, therefore, that the person who says that they are the leader of their home for himself to also be a follower of God. So the first thing is you have to love God. You love him by accepting his son as your Lord and Savior. You love him by loving his word also. If you say that you love God, you have to love his word because God and his word are one. And so he, the, the, that means that you have to love to, to not only come to church, but you have to love in terms of reading, studying his word in that regard, confessing it, doing it, meditating in it. That's how a godly father actually lives his life. So if you say that you are a godly father, it begins by loving God first. And if you don't love God, you can never be a good father. And how do you prove that you love God? By accepting his son Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Two, by loving his word. And three, by loving his presence. Do you know this is God's presence? God is in his house. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, there will he be in their midst. And so God is here. And so if you don't like going to church, Chances are that you don't like his presence. If you don't like his presence, you're not telling God that you love him. Oh, praise the Lord. So then, in that sense, we're saying that you, it is important for you to start as a good father, as a godly father, by loving God. The second thing that we have to talk about is that if you love God, you have to, as a father, Love your wife. If you are married, a husband, love your wife. If you don't love your wife, you really don't love God. Let me say it again. If you don't love your wife, if you married, you don't love God. Pastor, how can you say that? Because you remember what I said? If you love God, you love his word. And the word of God says... Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so if you love God and you love his word, as a husband who is a father, you have to love your wife. What does that mean to love your wife? How do you, I mean, what is the, the evidence, the test, the proof that you love your wife? It makes you selfless. If you really love someone, you are, that, in that regard, selfless. In fact, let me put it this way so you can understand. That you are prepared to give advantage to that person and not to take it from them. So you are not about, oh, wow, uh, somebody is misusing me, somebody is taking advantage of me. No, if you're giving it, how can it be taken from you? And so if you say that as a father and a husband, you love your wife, then what you do is, is that you put yourself away, outside, from any consideration of what about me? What am I getting from this? It is all therefore about the person who is the object of your love. Praise the Lord. And so if you say you are a good father, a godly father, and you love God, God says then, as a husband, love your wife. So, okay, if, uh, uh, what if the wife is out to lunch? I mean, uh, what, if, what if she's not doing everything right? It's amazing how God does not put conditions on his kind of love. He doesn't say that because the woman is out to lunch, the woman is not doing right, you therefore shouldn't love her. All he says, you as a husband love your wife. In fact, he goes on as far as saying that wash her with the water of the word. And so if you see something that you don't like, the Bible says use the word of God to wash your wife with that word so that she could be 
whom you want her to be, as the word says, but not simply to spurn her, not simply to say, well, you know, I'm not getting what I want anyway, so I'm just simply going to stand on my own self-interest. No, you can, love is not about self. Anytime it is about self, it is not love. Love is selfless. Praise the Lord. And so on this Father's Day, check yourself. As a husband, if you're if you, a father who's married, check yourself to see whether in fact you walk in selfless love towards your mate. Let me say one more thing on this. The difficulty that people have in loving their wives is also because they expect to be the ones to receive that love from their wives. So you're waiting, do me first before I do you. This kind of love is based upon expecting your spouse to meet a certain condition first, just in case. You do them first and they don't do you back. You do me first. I'm the man. I'm the head of the house. That is not love. Hello. Love simply says that you are going to take the initiative, even be creative, to find ways to demonstrate that you really care for someone, you love them enough that it is no longer about you, it is all about them. And I submit to you, as a seed carrier, when you sow that seed, you will receive amplification of that back to you. You will, see a, you will receive a multiplication of that back to you. You will receive a harvest back to you, if you, only you would do that. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, so, you go home today, fathers and our husbands, that is your test. This, for some of you, may be mission impossible. <laughs> but do it anyway, hello. Do it anyway. Praise the Lord. The godly father not only loves God, not only does he also love his wife, he loves his children. Amen. Number three, he loves his children. How can we prove that? How can we test that? Well, I'm going to give you some scriptures here to show you what God thinks about the man who is a godly father who loves his children. You see, if you don't love your, if you don't love God, you certainly will not be able to love your wife the way God expects you to love your wife. In fact, if your vertical relationship is not right, it will affect your horizontal relationship. So if there is a problem horizontally, it means there is a problem vertically. Did you hear that? If you have a problem with your spouse, it means that you have a problem with God. Receive it. Receive it. I can see the brakes being, being, being put on here. Receive it. It's true. <laughs> All right. So you gotta, if you love God, you can love your wife. And if you love your wife, you certainly can love your children. Now, there's a tendency, not all Africans, but some Africans, since I'm one, I can say that, to love our children more than we love our spouses. Because from the group or the ethnic group that I, I came from, uh, your wife is not part of your family. And, your, and so your children, you just all interested in your children, not your wife. The wife has her own family. And you, you, you have your own family. So you don't really often because the children will go towards your wife's family. It's not all African countries. No. It's not all African, even not in only not all Ghanaians. 
but from the group I'm from, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, that is the case. You go towards your mother's side. So the children are the mother's children, not your children. So you don't care about them. I mean, you do what you can to help them, but you really, you know at the end of it, they will go to their family side. You understand know what I'm saying? I remember when my father passed away and we went to Ghana, uh, my wife and I and, and my sister Grace, and, and uh, they had to sit as a family to decide some issues that had to uh, be decided on regarding the whole uh, arrangement for not only the service but also the burial. And we were not part of it because we were not of his side. Now you're paying for the casket, you're paying for everything, but you're not part of the family. You know what I'm saying? So if, if you have that kind of mentality, if you don't take care, it will affect the way you raise your children. And some of us come to the States, we learn the ways that are done differently, and, and some of us attempt to change that. Others of us still don't care. And we got to watch it. Now, for those of you who don't have the experience that I described, I don't know what your problem is then. At least, at least I have an excuse. Hello? But I love my children, so I don't have an issue there at all. I'm, I'm a... You haven't found a father that loves his children more than I do. I know there are other fathers. There are other fathers here who are just as good I know that, but since I'm the one speaking now, let me say that. <laughs> but the point is, is that if you don't take care, you don't really think about, well, you know, children don't forget about it. And then there's a certain tendency, I'm going to wait till the child reaches maybe the age of six for me to throw, you know, go to the park and you know, throw some balls and frisbees and what have you. But if it's four, uh, five, six years, I'll let the mother take care of the child. Men, we got to watch it. Because there's a spirit of the father that governs the house. The spirit of the father. And when the father is out to lunch, it affects the house. Because he is the head and everything then flows from the head. You follow? So the father has to love the child, his children. Now let me give you some uh, points here. Come with me to, you work on praise the Lord. <laughs> Go with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 17, verse 6. It says, then the question is, what happens to the person who really wasn't raised by a father and therefore didn't have the kind of history or legacy or experience with which to also uh, follow to do, to do the same. Well, thank God, that is the reason why God is the ultimate father. So even if the natural fathers are not available, are not around, or were not there to train up the child the way the child should go, we still have God the Father who can help us do that. Praise the Lord. It says, children's children are the crown of all men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Did you see that? The glory, not the sadness, not the difficulties and the problems and the issues. It says the glory of children are their fathers. So you have to do everything that you can so that your children in fact, come with me to Psalms 92. Uh, Psalms 92. Uh, let's go to uh, verse 13. Psalms 92 verse It says, Children, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. That's how your children can be, can, they can be your glory down the road. 
if you make sure that they are planted in the house of the Lord. It is your responsibility to plant your child in the house, not to visit, but to plant, to take root. It is your responsibility because those that be planted in the house, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. It is our responsibility, not the mothers in this case, the fathers. It's our responsibility to see that our children are planted in the house of the Lord. When you write your tithe, don't hide it from your child. Let them see that this money goes to God. And every week or every month, however often you do it, you teach the child, that's how you plant the child in the house of the Lord so they can flourish in his courts. When you pray, let them see you pray. Let them hear you pray. Praise the Lord. Because if none of these things are happening, how can you truly plant the child in the house of the Lord? How can they grow up to be your glory? You don't want your child to grow up and have nothing to prove, to show that they have been raised in the house of the Lord. There's, there's no, no victory, no success, nothing in their lives. Nothing. And, and you know, when, when you see that, don't blame the child. Blame yourself also. Because there was a time the child was at an impressionable age, meaning that they were at that time pliable, teachable, trainable. But somebody else trained your child instead of you. Somebody else planted a child somewhere else other than the house of the Lord. Another thing that we're supposed to do, go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 4. Talk about fathers. It says, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. You love your child, you don't provoke your child. If you provoke your child, then definitely there will come a time that they will retaliate. And you are waiting for them to demonstrate they are, the love towards you on Father's Day come, they don't even care about calling you, much less to give you anything. The only reason why it is so is because of what seed you sow. It says, and you fathers, provoke not your children. You know what it means? Just don't just find any selfish reason to just make your child angry, calling the child names. But bring them up in the nature. You bring them up. You, not the church. You, not the pastor. You, not the youth pastor. You bring them up in the nature and admonition of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are you getting this, fathers? Examine yourself in the light of this. Examine yourself in the light of this. Go with me to Psalms 27, 37, I should say. Psalms 37. And let's look at verses 25 through 26. Psalms 37, verses 25 through 26. I have been young, and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. See, when your seed is not begging bread, it's to your glory. Because you want your seed to be one, someone that actually gives bread to someone else. God uses to give bread to someone else. It's about time we work with God so that God can call upon us any given time to bless somebody else. Amen. Somebody else's child, if you will. Right? And for us being the ones depending upon it. Hello? It says that and, and then he says, he's ever mindful, merciful, and lendeth. He is ever merciful, ever merciful, 
Don't forget the scripture. We'll come back to it later. And his seed is what? Blessed. So we want our seed to be blessed. That, that's why we don't provoke our children to anger. And there comes a time with a child, you can reason with them. I remember I, I spanked Cobner until he's 10, 16. <laughs> and recently when my man of God, Dr. Dalla, went through with his daughter, I could understand that. And there, I, there's something about 16. <laughs> and they call it a sweet 16, but there's something about 16 that all of us, and not only our children now, but even if you go back long enough, you can tell that you did something nasty at the age of 16. Even though they call it sweet 16. It should be nasty 16. <laughs> eh? Blessed 16. Confession. Confession. Oh, okay. All right, let me change it. I have been corrected by the two ladies in the front here. They said I should say, I should make the right confession. So they are blessed 16s, okay. To receive a copy of today's message in its entirety, write to us at Word of Life Christian Center International. When you write, be sure to include the name of today's message and your choice of either an audio or video copy. CDs and audio tapes are $5 and video cassettes or DVDs are 10 This series is available in its entirety at a special package price by calling 615-876-3086 or by email at pastor1 at lifewordcenter.org. Oh, today we want to just uh, share a few things which we want to tell you. The Word of Life Christian Center International has a worship experience that you certainly will want to one day experience it for yourself. You know, you see us on TV and usually we edit it and so what you get is not a full picture of what goes on uh, in this sanctuary. And so, uh, Pastor Carlos and myself want to invite you to come and go ahead and, and invite them. We'd like to invite you to join us at a service here at Word of Life Christian Center International. We are called international not just because it sounds good as a name, but we actually have ministries in other countries in other parts of the world. We have sons in the ministry in South Africa, as well as in Zambia, as well as in Canada. And so when you contribute to the word of life, you're also contributing to missions work in other parts of the world. And so we want to invite you. Our services start at 1030 on Sunday morning and at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. And we trust God that you will be led one day to come and, and be here and enjoy the service that we truly believe will impact your lives. May God truly bless you. And we often say this when we end our services that Jesus, Jesus is Lord. And, and with it's all you're getting, getting get understanding. understanding. For the, the word, word of life changes, changes lives. lives. And love, love never, never fails. fails. Be blessed. See you next time. Bye-bye.